On Ethernet interfaces, OSPF uses a special process with one router elected as a designated router. In this video, we'll talk about the why and the how. This video is one of two videos that I made based on the scope of content in the CCNA CERT Guide, Volume 1, Chapter 23, Section 1. So in this video, we'll talk about the theory and concepts about the designated router and backup designated router, but not get into the command line interface. In the second video, we'll get into the command line interface about how to configure things, how to operate and verify things when using a designated router, that's broadcast network type, and when not using a designated router, say with the point-to-point -point OSPF network type. Now, the associated review videos happen after the second of the instructional videos, so that'll be the timing for those. At the end of this video, as always, I'll give you advice about how to best use the book with this video. I'll talk to you about more review, and I'll give you something a little extra this time about those OSPF network types. And thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate all the support you've been giving me. Keep it up. Do all the youtube -y things, like, share, subscribe, super thanks, etc. Those are much appreciated. And if you do ever look for new learning products from Amazon or Cisco Press, if you use that link, I'll get a few dollars affiliate sale. That's also much appreciated. All right, let's jump into it and talk about OSPF DRs. So let's start out with this analogy. Say there's a family with six siblings. They're adults. They like to play sports, but they don't live in the same place anymore. So they've got all these photos on their phones for all for all their different sports adventures, like this baseball player and cyclist and skier and so on. So they want to share photos with each other. Now, of course, this day and age, they might post them on a photo sharing site or something like that, right? But let's just say they want to get the photos onto their phones. Well, they might uh, trade their pictures directly with each other's sibling, right? So the uh, person playing baseball might you know, get in touch with each of the other siblings and exchange photos with them. And then maybe the cyclist gets in touch with the other four it hasn't talked to recently and exchange photos with them. And then the skier exchanges photos with the other three it hasn't talked to yet or so on and so forth. So everybody has to do this exchange directly with each other. And that's a little bit of a hassle. So then instead, let's try this on for size. Say the skier is one of those super organized people that we all know, right? And says, hey, I'll, I'll take care of this. You Get in touch with me, we'll share, and I'll share back out to everybody else. So there's our skier, and the skier shares with the cyclist back and forth, and then shares with the baseball player with a promise of whatever the skier learns from the baseball player, they share up to the cyclist and vice versa. All right, so it shares things out. And likewise to the tennis player and with the golfer and with the runner. So with this process, it's a little more efficient in terms of how often the photos go back and forth. And because the topic is OSPF, you can imagine OSPF does something that's akin to this, right? So here's what happens. If say you've got six routers attached to the same subnet and they want to become OSPF neighbors, they don't exchange their LSAs directly, as in the first part of that analogy. They use one router to distribute the LSAs to everyone. And we call that router that does the distributing the designated router. Its designated role is to distribute all those LSAs. So let's say router R3 wins the designator, designated router or DR election right now. Well, you guessed it, it has a neighbor relationship, and with that neighbor relationship, it sends and receives LSAs with each of the other routers, but they don't exchange the LSAs with each other, just with the designated router. So we need a DR for this to work, so we elect one, we being the routers. So here's how it works. Now, imagine all the routers come up at the same time, like there was the power was off, Power comes back on, all six of those routers power on. So there's an election when they're all initializing. So when that happens, when that's the scenario, amongst those that are trying to become DR, they send hellos, they look at each other's hellos, and they use some rules like this to decide who becomes DR. The winner is the one with the highest OSPF interface priority, and the interface priority is there for DR elections. That's what it's for. It gives us a way to configure a higher number to increase our chances of becoming the DR. But let's just say then the priority ties. Well, then the choice is made based on the highest, numerically, the highest OSPF router ID. So there you go. So a winner takes over and plays that role. It's the designated router. 
We also choose a backup designated router, or BDR, which is ready to take over for the DR should the DR fail. But if there are more than two routers in this subnet, then the rest of them have this role called DR other, or something other than the designated router, but it's called DR other, or sometimes druther because it's easy to pronounce. So those are your three states, DR, BDR, and DR other. Now let's talk about an election, not when everybody's coming up at the same time, but ongoing. So the scenario is this. There's a DR, there's a BDR, there's some DR others, and then the DR fails. So here's what happens. The BDR replaces the DR. That is, we don't replace the DR from amongst all the DR others. We replace it with the BDR and then replace the BDR from amongst the DR others. So we have a new election amongst the DR others to decide which has the highest priority or if it's a tie, the highest router ID. If in that scenario where we've already elected a DR and BDR, etc., we're stable and then the BDR fails, we just elect a new BDR from amongst the DR others. So we replace the BDR. Then imagine everything's stable and nothing fails, but instead just some new router joins the subnet. It could even have the highest priority and highest router ID. It does not take over. There's no preemption of the existing DR. There's no election, and this new router's role is DR other. Now, in the future, it might become the DR after others fail, but for now, it's a DR other. All right, so those are the rules. There's a lot to it. I'll give you a chance to practice that when we get later into the video and in the associated review exercises. Now let's just say, for the sake of discussion, R3 becomes the DR, R6 becomes the backup DR. There are some neighbor relationships, but they're a little different compared to what we've talked about before. The neighbors will settle into either a, quote, full state or a two-way state. So let me walk you through that for a moment. The blue lines with the circles represent neighbors in a full state, so the DR forms a neighbor relationship with all the other routers and reaches a full state because full state means we're exchanging LSAs over this neighbor relationship and DRs need to do that. All the other routers send their LSAs to the DR, DR sends them back out or new ones back out. Then the backup DR does the same thing. The backup DR does the same exchange of LSAs because it's ready to back up the DR. So if I go to either the DR or the BDR and look at all its neighbor relationships, they should all reach a full state, meaning fully adjacent, I'm exchanging LSAs. In contrast, all those druthers, they'll have neighbor relationships with each other, but they will settle into and stay in a, quote, two-way state, which means I've passed all the neighbor requirements, so we're neighbors, but we don't send LSAs to each other. It's perfectly normal for them to settle into this two-way state and stay there, all right? So that's one of the things that looks a little weird when you look at show commands and you think maybe something's wrong. Nope, that's just the way it is. So I'm going to walk you through three different examples of the DR election with these four routers connected to the same subnet 172.16.10.0. So in this case, all routers power on at the same time, and they have default priority settings of one. So they're going to tie on priority. They're all competing. They're all sending hellos. They're seeing the other three routers' hellos. They're looking at the values in the hellos, so they see, all right, we're tying on priority. What about the router ID? Well, the router IDs are spread around here, and clearly R4 has the highest router ID and R3 has the next highest. So R4 is going to be elected as the DR, R3 will be elected as the backup DR, and the other two routers will be DR others. Now let's imagine that had happened, but over time, eventually, router R4 loses power, and then router R3 loses power. Who takes over? Well, router 2... Remember, they both tie on priority, so router 2 has the higher router ID, so it's going to lose the election that comes up to become DR, and then once another router fails, R1 becomes the backup DR in that case, as an example. Then let's do another scenario. We're going to have them all power off and power back on at the same time in this case, but before we do that, let's just say in the interim, we configured priority settings on the interfaces. 
of four, three, two, and one, basically reversing the chances of the routers becoming the DR. Now, when we configured this, it did not change who was DR, right? There's no preemption of who's acting as the DR. But once configured, save the configuration, and then we power off and back on again at the same time, who's going to win the election? Well, clearly R1 has the highest priority. It's going to win as DR. Router R2 is going to be the backup DR. And then R3 and R4 will be DR others. So for those of you that care about the exam, if you're using the CCNA CERT Guide Volume 1, talk about Chapter 23, Section 1. In that section, if you watch both the instructional videos that are listed here, then it's pretty comprehensive to that section. You could get away with skipping that section in the book, picking up a little time, having a little reading break. In fact, there aren't any useful to read headings. That is, there's no heading in there where I say, oh man, you really got to read that no matter what. However, as always, if you read that section for an alternative view versus the videos, that's always useful. I try to make the videos take a little different take on the material than the books. So it's always useful, but not necessary in this case. All right, next up, there are no review videos associated with this first of the two videos for the section. The two review topics follow the next instructional video. So make sure and watch that next instructional video. Now, that next video will bring up the idea of a network type for OSPF, and it'll use names point to point and broadcast. And I mention it here as an extra because those are the terms you'll see in the CCNA blueprint in the exam topics. It's the broadcast network type that makes routers behave like we just talked about for the last 10 minutes, using a DR and a BDR. See broadcast type using the DR and BDR. Whereas the point to point type is an alternative that makes sense when the topology is point to point with only two routers in it. And it's more efficient and it's generally better. So watch for that in the second part of the next instructional video. Hey everybody, thanks for hanging out. Give me a like, give me a comment, give me a share. Those are the best ways you can help me out and uh, say thanks and help me do better at the channel. As always, if you're new, welcome. Click subscribe and the bell so you get notified about the new videos. Talk to you soon.